Hi, my name is Chris Eliasmith. I'm from the University of Waterloo and the director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience there. And I'm very happy to be at this symposium for cognitive architectures. And I will kick off my presentation. Let me just quickly share my screen. And uh, this is a recording after the fact to make up for the technical problems that I had during the symposium. So hopefully things work out better here. So I want to talk about SPAWN. SPAWN is a large scale brain model that my lab has developed over the last several years. The first version of SPAWN was published in 2012. And since then we've been making it bigger and I'd like to convince you better, better in the sense of more cognitively functional. So SPAWN itself, that's uh, actually an acronym that stands for Semantic Pointer Architecture Unified Network. The Semantic Pointer Architecture is a sort of series of techniques and components and things that I describe in this book, How to Build a Brain. And the first version of SPAWN is also described in detail in chapter seven of that book. All of the work that we do tends to be simulated in Nengo, including SPAWN. And if you want, you can download Nengo and SPAWN and play with them on your own. When I say bigger, I mean specifically that there are more neurons and more connections. So the original version of SPAWN was two and a half million neurons and the new version that I'll be talking about today has 6.6 .6 million neurons and over 20 billion connections. So we've not only just added more complexity for complexity's sake, something we'd like to avoid in fact, uh, but instead we've actually increased the functionality of SPAWN. So the original number of tasks SPAWN could do was eight and now it can do 12. I think you know, counting the number of tasks is a little bit of a mugs game as it were, because it becomes hard to do when you have tasks like instruction following. Maybe every time you tell it an instruction is doing a new task, I don't know. Um, so that is one of the new tasks that Spawn can do. And of course it can follow instructions to some extent, not as uh, anywhere near the kind of sophistication you find in people, but nevertheless, it um, becomes a bit strange to start counting tasks, but you know, it's, it's an, a ballpark way of sort of determining that there's a little bit more cognitive sophistication in this new version of the model. And uh, I think it's also interesting that, you know, when we added these new tasks, we didn't really have to change the architecture much. There's a few additional areas, but really it was more about making the existing areas more sophisticated. And we can think about this architecture in a couple of different ways. So one is anatomically, um, and that's what this slide is showing. It's basically mapping all the different parts of the model onto different brain areas. Um, I'll note that in the orange box there, that's the basal ganglia. So that's actually subcortical, but everything else is cortical. <laughs> Thalamus is also subcortical. Um, but the sort of important thing to keep in mind is that this sort of mapping of this model is really just uh, basically taking a huge number of simulated neurons. So we you know, simulate six and a half million neurons. We connect them all together in various ways, uh, which I'll talk about subsequently. Uh, and then we just simulate the model. So each one of those neurons generates spikes. Those spikes go to subsequent neurons. They you know, cause postsynaptic currents to happen and they're weighted in some way, et cetera. So really the model, if you wanna strip it down to it, is just a bunch of individual neurons being simulated and connections between all those. But of course we wanna understand the organization of that network. And so mapping it in this anatomical way is very useful. Every part of the model has some anatomical mapping uh, be it, you know, a sort of like a standard visual system. We've got V1, V2, V4, IT. Uh, so that's like the ventral visual stream. We of course have motor systems, M1, SMA, PM. Uh, I should comment that the input to spawn is one eye. So that's its perceptual system. And the output from spawn is moving a single arm, moving the muscles of, you know, a sort of physically modeled arm. And we also have a bunch of memory areas and these are used in many different ways. So some are kind of more working memory focused. Others are doing things more like keeping track of what particular task is happening at any particular moment in time. And uh, the basal ganglia, as I mentioned, sitting subcortically is kind of coordinating the flow of information between all of these components. Um, I should also note that this is, a, you know, there's an attempt to be physiologically plausible here too. So for instance, in the basal ganglia, where you have a lot of inhibitory connections, uh, those same inhibitory connections are realized in the model. So, you know, we try to do things like that, where you've got inhibition, you have inhibition, where you have excitation, you have excitation. We have sort of models of the right kinds of cells in the right kinds of areas and so on, uh, tuning curves, et cetera, right? Those are uh, generally matched to some extent. And so really it is a brain model, right? It's anatomically and physiologically has some sort of mapping that we can describe. Uh, but from a cognitive architecture perspective, we tend to take a kind of different view. And when we're talking about function in general, and that's a view more like this, where, you know, we have components that we've labeled with their function 
and interactions between those components. Now, uh, if you can remember back to the previous slide, these colors are uh, co you know, related between the two slides where working memory areas were sort of more frontal, motor output was in the motor areas, and so on. Um, but here we can see a little bit more about what each of the components are doing. So you know, we have a visual input hierarchy on the left-hand side. Um, we have information encoding happening in vision-related areas. We have working memories, but we also have things like transform calculations, which means like figuring out what sort of patterns are happening on the current input. Um, and then on the output side, we have something where you know, we have basically a conversion into some motor commands to allow the model to express its answers. Uh, and at the bottom there, we have action selection, which as you can see, is taking information from all of the components, but also projecting information back to the communication channels between those components. So it can let us, you know, root information from the vision uh, input area to working memory, or instead from working memory to the motor output side, or what have you, right? So you can set up this routing in different ways with the basal ganglia, the action selection uh, component, in order to perform different kinds of tasks. And uh, critically, you know, as we're building up this complexity, we are very interested in making sure that we increase the functionality of the system as well, right? We really want to show a link between complexity and improved function. So as I mentioned, the techniques that we're using to build this model are called the semantic pointer architecture. Um, it uses another framework called the neural engineering framework, which really lets us take sort of high level descriptions and map them into spiking neurons. Within the uh, book and the architecture in general, I kind of described four different elements and you can see them all showing up in different parts of the spawn model. So this includes things like semantics, uh, how representations inside the system have meaning, what their relationship is to the world and one another in order to determine how the system uses uh, those representations. We have syntax. Um, so this will kind of be obvious from later examples that in order to represent the kind of structures that you need to perform various kinds of cognitive tasks. We have you know, techniques for doing that, many of which are being realized in frontal areas. Uh, control, so the basal ganglia is the obvious case, doing things like action selection and allowing information to be routed between different areas. And then learning and memory is kind of throughout the system where we have sort of short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, various kinds of learning, some offline, some online, you know, using lots of different techniques that people are familiar with, all the way from sort of deep learning kinds of techniques, which we don't take to be biologically plausible, but are useful for constructing models, to much more reinforcement learning kind of uh, techniques implemented in basal ganglia, which we do take to be reasonably biologically plausible, and, and many things in between, in fact. So all of this is done with spiking neurons, and that's precisely because we're trying to build biologically based explanations of cognition, right? That's really what we're after uh, using this set of techniques. Um, so this notion of biological cognition is one that I uh, sort of introduce and talk a lot about inside the, in this How to Build a Brain book, where I talk in detail about the semantic pointer architecture. So you might be wondering what semantic pointers are. So it's, you know, the name of the architecture. And uh, without getting into this into too much detail, I just wanted to sort of introduce the notion so it's clear what, you know, what we're working with basically in these models. Semantic pointers are basically uh, you can think of them as abstract representations that are always implemented in spiking neurons or can be implemented in spiking neurons. Uh, these abstract representations are the kinds of things I was talking about that carry semantics in the previous slide. They're also the kind of things that enter into syntactic relationships that you want to encode into other semantic pointers. Uh, in general, um, you know, you can think of them as just being vectors. So, you know, people working with neural networks forever have talked about vectors and vector spaces and so on, and this is more of that. Um, tends to be a little bit more abstract than thinking of them as being directly embedded in the neurons. We have them sort of, we have methods for encoding them in neurons and manipulating them with neurons. Um, but one of their critical points is that they're always generated by some kind of compression operator. And the hypothesis is that there's different compression operators in different parts of the brain. So, you know, the way that you compress information in a visual system might be different than the way you compress it in a cognitive system or a spatial system. Um, but we can, in all of those cases, identify different kinds of operators and give a similar sounding kind of story where we take information, for instance, in the visual system as shown on the right hand side here, you know, in the form of like a raw input image and we compress it down to a bunch of features in a much lower dimensional space. So it's compressed. Um, and that's useful because it makes that representation, the compressed one, more efficient for manipulation. It's easier to move around, basically less information to transfer. And if you need to 
sort of uh, get uh, to the details of that representation, you can do a decompression or a, uh, some, some way of sort of expanding out what your uh, features are pointing to in order to answer more sort of semantically sophisticated questions. So this notion of semantic pointer has been very useful in large scale models like Spawn and others. Um, it's uh, one attempt to kind of unify a lot of different kinds of representations that we tend to come across in uh, cognitive science. So, you know, there are examples of using semantic pointers in dynamic systems for encoding continuous or discrete spaces, for encoding structures that are continuously or discretely best defined, um, for understanding semantics and the relation between, you know, different pointers can sort of define a uh, surface semantic space and that can be exploited for doing various kinds of uh, cognitive tasks and so on. Um, so in general, you know, this kind of representation tends to be one that uh, we have found really useful and is kind of throughout Spawn um, for performing um, not only things like motor actions or perceptual characterization, but also more cognitive kinds of processing, which I'll focus on. So just comparing Spawn uh, 1.0 to 2.0, there's been a couple of basic improvements. One is that characters that it recognizes are now up near human performance levels of about 98% on MNIST, which you know, has been reported as about how well people do. Um, the handwriting is better. Uh, so, you know, on the left hand side is Spawn 1's handwriting, on the right hand side is, by, on the right -hand side is Spawn 2. Um, the first column are digits, the second column are the model reproducing those digits. And so, you know, this is a bit qualitative, obviously, but uh, the idea being that on the right hand side, those second columns look a lot more natural. Um, they're not as sort of squiggly, they're smoother, and so on, uh, than on the left hand side. Everything in Spawn 2.0 is spiking. There were some non-spiking parts of the motor system in the previous model. Uh, we have better matches to things like serial list recall. So give it a set of digits and have it recall those back. And the match to the human performance is uh, improved now. There are more RPM patterns. So one of the things that Spawn 1.0 did was Raven's progressive matrix-like problems. This is a, an intelligence test. And uh, you know there was kind of a bunch of patterns it could get. Um, and you know, could get all the ones that were on the test, but we started sort of throwing other kinds of patterns at it and noticing that it would fail. And so we added, sort of uh, extended the ability to recognize RPM patterns. Uh, the vision system is significantly improved. Uh, what this has done is basically allowed us to uh, introduce tasks where we're now you know, showing the vision system, images like the one on the left there, um, full color. Before it was just recognizing digits only, MNIST. Um, now it can, you know, see these full color thing uh, images and classify those in one of a thousand different categories. And then we have used that to do a stimulus matching task where you basically show it two pictures one after the other and say, are those from the same category or not? And so that's the kind of task it couldn't perform before. Uh, what I'm showing here is the um, model running in Mingo, but uh, just the vision part of the model, and we can see sort of the spike type patterns that you see for these very static images, which is why you observe those sort of fairly well defined uh, time points or sort of changes in the spike rasters. Um, but you can also pretty intuitively see the compression happening here. So if you look at the left hand side, you see a lot of very dense, heavy spiking, and on the right hand side, you know, much less so. Fewer neurons are on, and each of those neurons is spiking less. So this seems to be a kind of compression over both time and space. Uh, Continuing right along to the motor system. It's also new and improved as it were. So not only is it completely spiking, but it's now fully adaptive. Um, so this movie is showing that. Um, and what we've got here is basically, this is a robot arm, which has been given a hammer that is never used before. And so when it tries to reach to its target, which is that little Santa Claus, it misses the target, but then it immediately begins to improve its performance. And so after a couple of reaches, right, it's still kind of missing the target. But by the third reach, it's actually reaching to the target now, which it wasn't doing before. And it's effectively learning how its dynamic model was incorrect and it's updating that model on the fly. And you can sort of see the spike neurons that are doing that on the left-hand side. So we can sort of look at this in a little bit more of a kind of cognitive task context where what we've done here is something that has been done with a lot of people and monkeys where you basically give them a joystick and say, okay, move the joystick to a target um, and then people will put a weird force field on the joystick. So it makes it hard to go to the target um, because basically the force field is constantly perturbing the mo motion. 
But after several hundred trials, you know, people and animals can, you know, move just like they did before there was any force field applied. And so we're doing the same thing here with Spawn, where we're getting it to perform a serial uh, working memory task, showing it four digits, and it has to repeat them back. And as it's trying to write out those digits, a weird force field is being applied. And so you can see, um, over time, it gets better and better and better. And so it's, you know, writing essentially gets more and more legible. And if you compare this to the standard handwriting, so this is handwriting before there's been any force field applied, you can see that, you know, it ends up uh, in a pretty similar kind of place. And if there is no adaptation, you can see it doesn't get any better and, you know, things kind of stay terrible on the output side. So this is really modeling um, actually a component which wasn't really reflected in those anatomical diagrams, some of the adaptation that's typically associated with the, um, with the cerebellum. And uh, that is something that we can combine with this more sophisticated visual system and uh, different kinds of uh, mappings between stimulus and response. And that's what this uh, particular slide is showing. So it's a little bit complicated. Let me take you through it. Basically, the model has been told, told if you see a, uh, so looking at the top row here, if you see a police vehicle, write a seven. If you see uh, a hockey player, write a three. Uh, if you see a whale, write a nine. And it's also been put in this force field. And so, you know, you show it a bunch of images and it responds appropriately. And we've done that, you know, uh, five times in a row here. And you can see that the performance is improving slowly as it gets more practice in, in this force field. And then at the dotted line, we're providing it a different set of mappings. So we're saying, if you see an organ, write a one. If you see a whale, write an eight. And if you see a, an army vehicle, write a two. Um, so despite having sort of switched the task and the instructions midway through, you can see that the writing continues to get better. So there's no interference here in any way. And it's able to actually do these two different, follow these two different sets of instructions. And so by the end, uh, at the very bottom, or the second from the bottom, we can give it three digits and say, OK, now perform a um, working memory task, and so it is shown 938 and it writes those out. Um, and those are all digits that it had actually practiced before. Um, and then we have it write three digits it never practiced before, and you can see that those are as good as the digits that it has seen before. So the idea here is that it's not just learned to write those particular digits, it's actually learned to write in general in that uh, circumstance. It's kind of generalized across the entire set of digits that it knows how to write. Um, or arm movements in general, if you will. I guess one other thing I should point out is that on the left-hand side, you see the letter A followed by a number. That's basically telling Spawn what particular task to perform at any point in time. Um, so the first A9s, those are all, you know, perform your um, instruction following, and A3 is do a uh, working memory kind of task. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, one of the big changes to Spawn is instruction following, and so we can uh, distinguish two kinds of instructions that Spawn can follow. One is what we call simple instructions. You can imagine this is basically instructions that the agent's been trained on. So over and over and over again. So, you know, every time you see a one, write a three. Every time you see a two, write a four. And you do that over and over again. So it becomes kind of habit. Um, or we have more complicated kinds of instructions, which are changed trial to trial. And we call this the instructed stimulus response task. So in this instance, at trial one, you know, the model is told, if you see one, write an eight. If you see a two, write a one. And in the second trial, it's told, if you see a one, write a two. If you see a two, write an eight. Now, the same kind of comparison between simple and instructed uh, instruction following has been performed with people. So we can go and look at a uh, comparison in uh, reaction times to this sort of task. Of course, we can't really, or we don't have access to recordings of brains while people are performing the task, but we do have reaction times. And uh, this first graph is showing what happens when we do the simple task. Um, on the, so let's start on the right-hand side. That's the Spawn 2.0 uh, model. In the green, we have the human performance. Uh, we can see those are comparable. Um, and then the left two require a little bit of uh, description. So the blue on the left is kind of just taking the part of Spawn that we think is important for determining the timing of instruction following. Um, and the orange is, okay, let's just add a constant, which we say is like taking care of, you know, uh, vision and motor control. And we can see that if we do that and pick the constant right, then we can get a reasonable uh, match to the human data as well. Uh, we can do the same thing for instructed stimulus response task. Again, uh, you'll see you know, everything matches quite well, but, and, and the really big chain is in the instruction processing part of the model. Right? So this lets us you know, test a fairly specific hypothesis about what is causing the reaction time difference that we observe in human behavior. 
Uh, and it also shows that, you know, the other parts of spawn are not kind of changing in some way that uh, messes up reaction time. They're consistent enough and so on that uh, they are able to account even in the context where we have two significantly different tasks um, for exactly the kind of time it takes for people to perform that same task. And last but not least, we've compared just the difference between these two. So subtracting uh, the top slide from the bottom slide, and you can see that basically these differences are very consistent across all the models, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, and uh, this sort of speaks to uh, an explanation, a fairly natural explanation of you know, what's happening in the human case is that uh, it's not just that you're being sort of told more complicated things or your auditory system is taking longer to process the instructions or what have you, but it's really that when the task is being performed, right, uh, you, there are more steps and those more steps take a longer period of time, right? And so it seems like a nice way of comparing a you know, fully fleshed out big complicated brain model to some uh, very specific tasks that are run in humans uh, and show that, yeah, we can actually match some of the kind of standard cognitive measures that we might make. Now, one trick with adding, or challenge, I guess, with adding uh, something like um, instruction following is precisely that we have a big brain model, but we don't have a lot of brain data in this kind of context. And so what I'm gonna show you uh, from now on is really just exploring what is the sophistication of this model and we don't have direct comparisons at yet at least to any particular uh, brain data okay so let's move so those are kind of simple examples of instruction following but you know spawn can do a lot more now um, and i like to think of this as a kind of mental gymnastics where you basically give a series of instructions and the model kind of goes through them it can go through them internally or it can write out answers halfway through um, but the instructions can be fairly sophisticated and they can build off of one another uh, so in general, just to give, uh, sort of give you the lay of the land, uh, instructions are presented to spawn by a series of like if-then type rules, and then those are categorized into these sort of subtasks. Um, so you could say something like, if you see a one, write an eight. Uh, if you see a four, write a two, right? And you can have an, any number of those strung together in a single subtask. And then you have different subtasks. So you could say, you know, if you're shown a dog, perform a working memory task. Right, so some these other kinds of mappings, you can have a bunch of those, and then you can move through those tasks, subtasks in any way that you want. So you could say, okay, just do task subtask number two. Or if you start in subtask one, you could say, just go on to the next one, go on to the next one, go on to the next one. And so on the, at the bottom here, we're showing what input is shown to spawn in order to get it to do these different kinds of things. So if it's shown M, it's gonna go into this instruction following mode where it's going to you know, follow instructions and then if it, we wanted to start at a particular subtask, we just say PN, and if we wanted to do the next, next subtask, we show it a P. All right, so with that in mind, what kind of things can we get Spawn to do? So here it's doing a sort of a question answering task, we call it, where we show it a set of digits, and then we say, what's in position three, P3, and it writes out a six, meaning that, oh yeah, that was what it thinks is in position three. Um, now we're asking it a different kind of question, where we're saying, what is in position one, and it wrote out a two, uh, or rather, we asked it, where is the two? And it wrote out a one. And then last but not least, we're switching back to a position question and saying, what's in position two, right? So you notice that two is the same, but because the subtasks are different, it's responding differently. So, you know, here we're kind of just doing a bunch of manipulations of a task that Spawn was already able to do, but we can do those manipulations sort of on the fly without telling it the list again or anything like that. Okay. For this set of uh, examples, what we're doing now is combining subtasks. So here we're gonna have a memory task. We're then gonna um, tell it to count its memory. So increase the values of its memory by some amount. And then we're gonna ask a question about the result at the very end. Right? so it's getting a little bit more sophisticated in, with different kinds of tasks and having the results of those different tasks interact with one another. So let's start it off. So uh, MP1 means your memory task, start at position one, it's shown three, two, six. Then it's saying, now we're saying, okay, add three to all of those numbers. And so it's counting up by three, and then it's writing out the result. So it was shown three, two, six, and it's writing out six, five, nine. And then we're saying, okay, now what do you have in position two in your memory? And so it writes out a five, right? Which is the second item in the list that it had constructed from the first item. And last but not least, um, what we're doing here now is going to show uh, sort of lots of different action, interactions between four different subtasks. And uh, 
The first one, uh, it's called find pattern. This is like the Raven's progressive matrices where basically we're gonna show it, you know, some sets of exa example patterns and it has to infer what the pattern is. It's gonna be very simple in this case. Um, QA is question answering, it's gonna do that. When it says apply pattern, that means basically add. So it's like the counting task that we just saw. Uh, and uh, we can see how it can basically use intermediate results from previous subtasks to perform a subsequent task. All right, so let's kick this one off. So MP1, you know, start at the beginning. And now it's being shown, you know, if you have a one, it's followed by a three. If you have a two, it's followed by a four. So now it's inferred, ah, you're going up by two. So now we're showing it three numbers and asking it what is in position two, and it's writing out a seven. And then we're saying, oh, you know that pattern you found, apply it to that list. So basically add two to all the items in the list. So now it's writing out uh, six, nine, four. And then at the very end, we're saying, okay, you remember the position we asked you about? Add that to the pattern that you uh, discovered. And it wrote out a four because two, which was the pattern it discovered plus two, which is the uh, list position it was asked about equals four. Okay, so you know this is again, hopefully a demonstration of some reasonably sophisticated reasoning that uh, Spawn is able to accomplish. Again, all with spiking neurons um, and using these uh, techniques that I briefly mentioned effectively, didn't really talk about in detail, um, specified in the semantic pointer architecture. So hopefully that gives you a sense that by when we add these six and a half million, or I guess add four million additional neurons, that we've sort of spent them in very clear ways. We've made the motor system much more sophisticated and adaptive, the vision system is much higher resolution and many more channels, and it can do more sophisticated things, recognize a thousand categories. And we've also uh, used a lot of those resources to do this more sophisticated instruction following where you can give it these you know parsable instructions it can parse them and then, then it can turn them into to, uh, actions and behaviors and cognitive actions recognizing patterns increasing lists memorizing numbers answering questions about its internal representations and so on so just to quickly conclude i'll note that there are many different kinds of models you can build with the spa and here's a, a list of a bunch oh actually today i heard that that very first one has been accepted at psych review so we're very excited about that um, but yeah, these techniques are quite general. And really what we're doing with things like integrating short and long-term memory is building components that we hope to one day integrate into Spawn and make it a much more sophisticated model than what it currently is. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, to conclude that hopefully it's clear that the approach we're taking here is really in a functional approach to neuroscience and uh, biological modeling. So there are a lot of models out there which sort of increase the sophistication of the model by adding biological detail or numbers of neurons, which increases the connectivity, but doesn't increase the function or what is explainable by that model um, at a cognitive or functional level. And so that is something that we're really interested in doing. And we think that these kinds of techniques are useful, right? There's definitely a long way to go. You know, Spawn has six and a half million neurons. The brain has billions and billions and billions, 80 billion or something, right? So we're obviously not that close in some ways, but in other ways, uh, it's kind of surprising how far we've gotten with that many neurons when we've, you know, sort of spent them carefully. And it's allowed us to test out hypotheses about how, um, you know, structures like the basal ganglia play important roles in cognitive um, tasks and to show that we can do often simple cognitive tasks, but nonetheless, I think ones which are clearly cognitive. So hopefully uh, this kind of combination of techniques, SPA and NEF, and tools like Nengo, which help makes it easy to implement the SPA and NEF, are something that other people will adopt and use to demonstrate uh, you know, a cognitive task of their liking. And as a community, we can build up a cognitive architecture which integrates the best of everybody's output sort of into one grand unified model. Uh, I think that's maybe a long time coming, but maybe something that if, if other people are interested in, please do get in touch and I'll be happy to uh, you know, direct you towards all of the uh, models and things that I talked about today and um, point you to the tools and so on. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will just thank the uh, many people who were involved in building Spawn. All of the components were built by different people. Um, right now, the current lab is updating a lot of these components, which hopefully will be integrated uh, uh, someday soon. And there's a couple of links for you if you'd like more information. Thank you.